Hello, everyone. This is Will Rosenblum again, librarian trainee at the Belmore Memorial Library. For our second lecture, we're going to move away from history a little bit and talk about literature. We're going to do an analysis of Shakespeare's Sonnet 12 for National Poetry Month, as designated by the Academy of American Poets. This is really one of my favorite poems of all time, so I'm really excited to, to dig into it with you today. All right, so without further ado, this is Sonnet 12, which I'm going to read and then we will explicate. When I do count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime and sable curls all silvered o'er with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, borne on the bier with white and bristly beard, then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake, and die as fast as they see others grow. And nothing against time's scythe can make defense, save breed to brave him when he takes thee hence. So, of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets, uh, the first 126 are written to a friend, uh, particularly a young male friend. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that this friend was the Earl of Southampton, but we can't really know that with any certainty. All we know is that in these, these sonnets to these really direct letters to this friend, um, uh, there's a clear message that, that Shakespeare is urging him to do something for his legacy. Um, and we're going to talk about that now. Now, this is an example, a prime example of the English or Elizabethan sonnet which is similar to the Petrarchan or Italian sonnet in that it is still 14 lines, um, but the rhyme scheme is different, okay? We have three quatrains and that rhyming couplet at the end, but the rhyme scheme is A, B, I'm gonna show you here, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and then for that couplet at the end, still G, G, okay? So time, prime, night, white, leaves, sheaves. And we have something interesting. We have herd and beard. Now, in the original pronunciation, that would be closer to herd and beard. So it does rhyme. Then make, forsake, go, grow, and of course, defense, hence. Uh, which really, that rhyme scheme keeps it together and keeps it consistent. Um, and we have still uh, between lines eight, and nine, right here, we have the volta or the volte, where we see a shift in the subject matter, which we're going to talk about as we do this explication. So to start off, when I do count the clock that tells the time, we know immediately right here uh, that, that this sonnet is going to be playing with the concept of time. We see the tempest fugit, or time is fleeting, motif used throughout. Um, and at the end, we're going to really see that come into a little bit of the carpe diem or the seize the day motif. When we get to the end, we'll talk about that. When I do count the clock that tells the time, when I'm cognizant of, of the hours uh, and the passing of time, and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, okay, the beauty of the sun going down uh, and moving from day to night. When I behold the violet past prime, the beautiful flower that is no longer quite in bloom, and sable curls, black hair, all silvered o'er with white, okay, aging, getting older, losing one's initial youth and beauty. When lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, the trees that used to be so full of beautiful leaves that kept uh, the herds of sheep covered and, and, and under the shade, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, covered by those fallen autumn leaves. And we get my favorite line here, born on the beer with white and bristly beard. This is a direct reference to King Arthur's death. Okay, Lamord de Arthur, the death of Arthur was published in 1485 when William Caxton brought the printing press to England. It was one of the two first books 
published in England. You had the Bible and you had Lamor de Arthur. And in that, which is really the touchstone version of the Arthurian legend that the English national ethos is most familiar with. Okay, King Arthur, as he's dying at the end, he sails off to Avalon, born on a beer. That's a flat boat. Uh, and then he's, he's old with white and bristly beard after his duel uh, against his son, Mordred, that takes both of their lives. Um, so now when we have all of these things, all of these motifs of aging, time, and, and, and becoming old and, and, and losing um, uh, primacy and youth, then, here's the switch, then of thy beauty do I question make. Now I'm going to question what is so beautiful about uh, about, about beauty itself, about youth, about about uh, life and aging, that thou among the wastes of time must go, since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake. That which is beautiful, that which is sweet, forsakes itself as it dies, and s as fast as you see others grow. One flower dies, another grows. One person dies, and here we go, and another is going to take its place. And nothing against time's scythe, the grim reaper, death incarnate, can make defense save breed. Seize the day and have children to brave death when he takes thee hence. If Shakespeare's trying to convince this friend of anything, he's saying, have children to live on after you, even though that which is beautiful, everything comes to an end, time is fleeting. If you breed, if you have children, then you live on. You live on and, and, and your legacy speaks for you which a lot of Shakespeare's earlier sonnets are, are pretty convinced that this is the only way that someone can live on. This would eventually change in some of his later sonnets when Shakespeare himself realizes that he's not going to have a male heir because his only son dies at a very early age. That's when Shakespeare starts to realize, well, maybe it's my words that will be my heir. Maybe my words will be my legacy. But back here in the, in the early sonnets, he's pretty convinced that it's only through progeny through having children uh, that you can live on. So that's pretty much it. That is, uh, the, I, I love this sonnet. I think it's, it's, it's one of my favorites and, and I hope you enjoy it too. Uh, that was just really a quick analysis. If you have any requests, please shoot an email to ask at belmorelibrary.org and you can just put as the subject line lecture series. At this point, I'm happy to do history. I'm happy to do literature. I'm happy to do philosophy if that's something you're interested in. I mean, if you want science, uh, that's a little bit out of my depth. I'd rather stick to the humanities, but anything you might be interested in, just go ahead and shoot an email. I've included a link here. If you can't access it through, uh, the, through, the, through the video, you can go ahead and I think I'll, I'll try to put it underneath in the section below the video where you can see Sir Patrick Stewart of uh, X-Men and, and Star Trek and, well, Royal Shakespeare Company fame, uh, Sir Ian McKellen's best bud. You can see him doing this sonnet as he's been doing uh, kind of a sonnet a day on Twitter. Even if you don't have a Twitter account, you can still use this link to watch the video of him reciting the sonnet. And once again, I really hope you enjoyed this. And please, if you have any requests, send them right through to ask at belmorelibrary.org. Okay, thanks so much.